Good morning, Cornerstone. We're glad you've joined us this morning as we worship the Lord together. We open his word. We pray that uh, this has been a good weekend for you and you're trusting the Lord together. I invite you to stand with me as we read the Bible and direct you to turn to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13. Our focus for the message will be verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. We read this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, your bodies, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or reasonable service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Goes on to say in verse 3, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, don't think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace, Given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, then according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. 
And then in verse 9, we read this, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind a diligence. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Would you join me together in prayer? Father, we thank you for the opportunity it is to open your word. And in these unique circumstances where we find ourselves worshiping uh, from home or perhaps from a vehicle or at work or in the office or wherever our people are, we thank you for the privilege that your word knows no bounds, that the church is not about a building, that we are bound together by our hope in Christ. As we look to your word, we pray your Holy Spirit would teach us, give us hearts to hear, sensitive spirit, cause us to be teachable. And Father, once again, we present ourselves to you, our body and our mind. We pray that you would transform us into the image of your precious Son. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dr. Viggo Olson is a native Nebraskan. In fact, he grew up in Omaha, and he served Christ for many years in Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Olson is now in his 90s and retirement years, but as a young man, before he entered the mission field and he was at medical school, he doubted the Bible. For him, science was everything. But as his understanding of science grew, it pointed him to the reality of a creator. Finally, after much battle with God's Spirit, he was convinced that Jesus Christ really died on the cross and rose again to offer him eternal life. And Dr. Olson put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. God called him to the mission field and to Bangladesh, where he was a church planner and a Bible translator. He also served there as a surgeon. And when he came back to the United States on furlough, he was often asked to speak to high school and college students. When he did so, he would frequently open the Bible to Romans chapter 12. He would point them to verses 1 and 2. He would challenge them to present themselves, their bodies, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. Consecrate yourself to the Lord and see what he can do through your life. He would tell them about his medical training, his love for medicine. He would tell them how God had married that love for medicine to his calling to missions. And at the close of the service, Dr. Olson would often hold up the scalpel and he would challenge students to become instruments fit for the master's hand. Verses 9 through 13 of Romans 12 is a list, and sometimes we lists like this can seem like a set of do's and don'ts. But we must not lift it from its context. Romans chapter 12, God calls you and I to consecrate ourselves as instruments in the master's hand. And then look at what God can do through us. He gives us serving graces through that consecration to him. And then he begins to work inside of us, transforming us, creating within us new capacities of how to relate to others. A way of relating to each other that we would never be able to do in and of ourselves. But because of God and his incredible work inside of us, as we respond in surrendering ourselves to him, he creates within us this capacity, first of all, to love others without hypocrisy. Now think about that. Let love be without hypocrisy. That's verse 9. That sounds like saying the same thing as love like Jesus. Jesus loves without hypocrisy. No pretense, no hidden agenda, no self-serving motivation. 
How do you and I do that? How do we love like Jesus? I think a good thing we, for us to do is to listen to Jesus. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus tell us followers we need to do in order to love like him? Well, first of all, we need to realize that loving like Jesus is what Jesus wants us to do because he has already loved us that way. Realize that loving him is what Jesus wants us to do. John 13, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Don't settle for easy love. I mean, there's some kind of lo- there's love that is natural in this world that's easy. It comes easy because somebody else loves us and we can respond to that love. And Luke 6.32 says, if you, if you love those who love you, Jesus tells his disciples, what credit is for that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. But love that is without hypocrisy is love without strings attached. Jesus calls you and I to love our enemies. Love your enemies. Luke 6, 35, and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For the Most High Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Yeah, I like this quote from Abraham Lincoln when he was asked how he dealt with his enemies. He said, if at all possible, I turn them into friends. But sometimes there are enemies that we cannot turn into friends. And yet God calls us to love without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy was a word which described acting. And often in the Greco-Roman world, actors would hold masks to their face. And it was not at all uncommon for the same actor to represent multiple characters. Love which is from hypocrisy is fake. It's acting. It's manipulative. It has an agenda. It wants something from the other person. It wants their applause. It wants their love, their acceptance, their adoration. It wants their attention. It wants their affection. And love from hypocrisy will dry on the vine when it is not love. But love without hypocrisy is a different kind of love. The love in our world is give-take. I love you, so you love me. But love without hypocrisy is not a two-way street. It is not a give-and-take. It is love, love, love. I love you, no matter what. Whether you love me or not. And because you have come to know Christ as your Savior, His Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Christ in you can do the impossible. He has made you a new person. And the believer who consecrates his body and his mind to Christ initiates a transformation process from within. And at the very core of your person, you discover a longing and a desire to love differently than you have loved before. And as you grow in Christ, your capacity to love like Jesus will also increase. And I don't know how, I really don't know how, you and I could possibly find within ourselves the ability to love without hypocrisy, to love like Jesus, except that we are first loved by Jesus himself without that hypocrisy. And when Jesus loves us like that, we experience his love without hypocrisy. It clears away within us an area, a capacity from which a new kind of love for others is given birth. Romans 5.5 says, The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Where is the Holy Spirit at right now? 
If you're a child of God, God's Holy Spirit is inside of you. That's the same place where God has poured out richly, lavishly His love. And His aim is to use that love that He has for you as a trigger agent to create with you a capacity to love without condition, to love without strings, to love without hypocrisy. And when you do that, you can love somebody even if they don't love you. And if they love you back, well, their love then is icing on the cake, a joy, something you can enjoy because you don't have to have it. Love without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Verse 9 goes on to say, and as you consecrate your whole walking around self to Christ, He transforms you. Your values change. The way you feel about evil, the way you feel about good, Speak to your values that you hold deep down inside of you. And you grow in your love for what God loves and your hatred of sin. What God loves, you come to love. What God hates, you come to hate. And especially, you abhor evil that is sometimes in you, your own sin. Jeremiah might have been the godliest man in Jerusalem. Some call him the weeping prophet. He is from the Old Testament and he ministered to God's people, the Jews, and they had rebelled against God. And he oftentimes poured out their heart and he said, heartache is coming. Judgment is coming. And then it came and he sat on the hillside and watched the city burn, his hometown. And he lamented when he wrote the book of Lamentations. His heart broke with repentance. One terrible thing after another happened. But listen to what he prays. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 39 and 40. Listen to this. Why should any living mortal or any man, any woman, any person offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways. Let us return to the Lord. As our world shakes its fist at God and is angry for the hardships that come on them, might we as born again believers be different? We don't always understand, often we don't understand why God does what he does. But what complaint can we have? It is enough, is it not, that God forgives our sins? And gives us eternity with Him. Might that be a hope that wells up within us? Might that be what shapes our heart so that we come to love what God loves and hate what God hates, abhor and cling? Those are such intense, fully sold out terms. Hate evil. But reach out and grab hold like a vice. On to those good and perfect gifts that come down from above from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, even a shadow of turning. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Paul continues in verse 10, brotherly love refers to familial bonds or affection. We get our word Philadelphia from it, but it means the kind of bonds that are natural in a family between brothers and sisters and parent and child and grandparents and grandkids and even cousins. But here's what the New Testament does. It takes that family bond, that word that speaks of family ties, and he And it applies it to the way you and I are to relate together in the body of Christ. We are to see each other as siblings, as family. 1 Timothy 5 captures this principle well. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, do not sharply... You know, Paul is speaking to this young pastor, Timothy, and he says, oh, Timothy, Timothy, don't make the mistake of sharply rebuking an older man but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. The reality is that many people come into our church 
longing for a family not filled with anger, strife, and accusations. Maybe they don't even know that's what they're looking for. But they are. And sometimes those of us, and I say this tenderly and gently, that sometimes those of us who have loving, supportive families at home take the sense of church family too lightly. But if God has given us much in our own family at home, then do you not think that that is a responsibility that we have to look through the eyes of Jesus at others who come into our church body longing, just longing for healthy family relations? And how that can be you and me that come alongside of them and look at them as brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, grandmas and grandpas. Jesus reminds us that even a person's family can be their enemy. A man's enemy will be the members of his own family. Relationships are getting tougher because families are breaking down at ever-increasing rates. A family is the place that you and I, very young age, first learn how to love others, how to relate to others. Family is the kindergarten of relationships. But our world no longer values marriage and godly parenting. And the end result has been a hollowing out of the human soul. Jesus says this, that as the day of judgment approaches, Matthew 24, 12, because lawlessness increases, most people's love will wax cold. God created you and I to thrive in families where love is fervent and vibrant, but as sin abounds, Family relationships become, can become more like a long, unending, bitter, and barren winter. We turn to these people that are closest to us for what our heart needs the most and, are, and, and find rejection and betrayal and heartache. What does that do? And for that reason, more than ever, you and I must be devoted to family love in the church. For you and I to relate to each other as family. We're going through a time right now where we as a church and as a people, as a nation, are learning what we can do without. Things are being stripped away. And for us as a church, that is what the case too. One day we'll come back from this, we'll get through this, and perhaps the Lord will have taught us a, a more appropriate set of priorities. And I suspect that at the top of that list will be the capacity of physically relating to one another as family. Those little graces, the handshakes, the elbow bumps, the hugs, the different personality quirks, the loud person, the quiet person, the person you have to draw out, the person who... uh, is going through so much and shows it. We're family. And that is so important to Paul that his word choice in this passage could be rendered this way. Be family bonded to one another in family bonds. uses the same word Philadelphia twice. Be family bonded to one another in family bonds. We are to let love of the brethren continue, Hebrews 13, 1. And as a consecrated believer, you are in a new family kindergarten. You've come to know Christ as your Savior. If you're young in the Lord, you've come to know Christ as your Savior. If you've consecrated your whole walking around self, then God has set up a sort of kindergarten in your heart where He is teaching you how to do family. Your instructor is God. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4.9. He says, Now, as to the love of the brethren, 
You have no need for anyone to write to you. Why? Because you yourselves are taught by God to have family, love one for another, a brotherly love for one another, sisterly love, church family love. And that's what you're learning. That's what God is teaching you for each and every one of us. Peter adds this in 1 Peter 2.22. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls, that's consecrating yourself, your whole walking around self to the Lord. That's Romans 12.1 and 2. Because you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for sincere love of the brethren. Because that consecration is cleared inside of you space to learn to love without hypocrisy, to love with sincerity of brothers and sisters. Fervently, fervently, fervently love one another from the heart. Fervently make it your priority. You can hardly be devoted, you and I can hardly be devoted to family bonds in a church unless we're willing to prefer one another in honor. And so that's what Paul says in verse 10, after he tells us to grow in our brotherly love to each other, he says, give preference one to another and in honor. Give preference means showing eagerness and honor refers to the value or the esteem that you place on another. And since the word prefer or showing eagerness was used as an athletic term to describe somebody who was out in front of the race, we could also render this passage Take the lead in honoring one another. Outdo one another in showing honor. A friendly competition. What, how would that change the body of Christ and Cornerstone Bible Church? What virtue would that unleash in us? If we were to outdo one another in giving honor to each other. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, it's easy for us. I see that word fervency in the middle of the verse. And it's easy for us to confuse enthusiasm for diligent, fervent service in Christ. And uh, it's no secret that I'm a fan of the Chiefs. And when they played in the Super Bowl and we had the Super Bowl party here at church, that uh, enthusiasm was apparent. And when they won, I gained fun. <laughs> but you know, that kind of fun is really is short-lived. It's already a new season and free agency underway and thinking about next year. And if they had lost, I wouldn't have lost a whole lot of any real value. It's just, I'm just a fan. That's it. I don't have any skin in the game, except for maybe a little bit of trash talking and taunting and ego along the way. But consecrated followers of Jesus do not sit in the bleachers as fans. Within you, God's transforming work is growing a longing to be involved in the life and service of a church. I'll say this to you, not so much as a preacher, but as a pastor, as one who cares about you. If you have come to know Christ as your Savior, you've consecrated your whole walking around self to Christ. You will create for yourself frustration if you sit back as a fan because what God is doing in you is drawing out a desire to put skin in the game. He's made you into a servant of Christ and that is where your joy and your happiness were Attitude is best as you grow in relationship to your church. He fills you so that you can serve from your overflow. He equips you with giving graces needed for the church to effectively function as one body. And whether you're a toe or a hand or a mouth, don't lag behind in diligence. Get in the game. Let the Spirit boil in you. Serve Christ. And even now, perhaps you might think, well, what can I do? We're not even gathering as a church. You have an opportunity to pick up a phone and to call somebody. Just say this. I was wondering how you were doing with everything going on. 
Maybe there's somebody on the fringe or somebody that has been marginalized that you can reach out to. I, I bet they would love to hear from you. They would love to have somebody just ask how you're doing. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, verse 12. This is a call to endurance in tough times. And I believe those of us who know Christ should be when faced with trials, such as the crisis that we now find ourselves in, the sanest, the most stable, the most balanced, the clearest thinking, well-founded people anywhere. Why? Because we have a hope in us that we can rejoice in, that transcends the circumstances. God's Holy Spirit is working in us to create a capacity to be able to persevere in tribulation. That word persevere means endure, to be able to stay under. And the word tribulation means pressing, pressing together, pressure. Today's circumstances could well be described as pressure. I love this meme from a friend's Facebook page. And it is meant to describe specifically a dad. And yet this is all of us. Dad or mom, husband or wife, man or woman, boy or girl. This is all of us. On the outside, people look at us. and There's that silhouette of a face. People look at us and we're saying we're fine. But on the inside, we feel pressure. We feel the pressure of stress. We wonder, are we doing enough? Am I doing enough? Do I really matter? Am I setting a good example for my family? Am I being what the people around me need to be? Is there not more I ought to be doing? And there's going to be a lot of people very soon, if not already, feeling pressure, not only from the reality of the physical disease itself, and many are touched by that and are going to be, but there's going to be people feeling a lot of pressure because of the financial fallout, the effect it's going to have on our economy and otherwise. We all feel pressure inside. But the believer knows there is a purpose to trials. And the pressure works in a transforming way. It is not a pressure that crushes. It is a pressure that shapes. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren. I love that, don't you? Consider it all joy when you encounter various pressures, trials, knowing that the, the testing or the proving of your faith produces endurance or perseverance. It's the same word. And let endurance or the capacity to remain under the pressure have God's perfect result so that you may perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect, not, as, not so much as someone who never makes a mistake, but perfect in terms of mature. And you do so, and as you do so, and as you do that, as you remain under that pressure, because you've consecrated your life to Christ, you are His, you are an instrument in the hands of the Master. Lord, that's who I am. I've surrendered myself to you. I am yours. God's transforming work of renewing your mind and refreshing your spirit has begun. And because of that, those pressures have a purpose and have a reason, and you can consider it all joy. And then as you do that, and you feel that pressure, that might be uncomfortable and disquieting, one of the greatest, most precious and priceless gifts will become yours. And God will give this to you. It is this, increasing devotion to prayer. I don't know about you, but when I feel desperate, that's when I pray. I, I, when I know I have a need. I, I know we tell ourselves, wouldn't it be a, great if we could pray when things are going well? But the reality is, 
We all have needs. We're always desperate. We just don't realize it as much sometimes as we do right now. But what a gift it is. What a gift it is to grow in our prayer life, to call on the Lord. He is a God who delivers his people. Contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. And I believe that passage, contributing to the needs of the saints, I believe that is speaking of you and I reaching inward towards one another in the body of Christ and practicing hospitality, I believe can be a strategy for outreach and should be a strategy for outreach in that passage. And I'll explain that to you in just a moment. But contributing is the familiar Greek term koinonia that's translated fellowship. And often we think of that in social gathering, and it can be that. But originally the word described a business partnership which involved making an investment. Some number of people would partner together with a shared vision and would invest their own skin in the endeavor. They became partners. They became members of one another. True Christian fellowship means sharing the same vision of coming alongside of one another with shared resources that is contributing to the needs of the saints, fellowship, partnership, as well as getting the gospel out to those without Jesus. Verses 3 and 5 of Philippians 1, Paul says this, I thank my God for you. Every time God reminds me of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you. He's just effusing, isn't he? I so appreciate you. In view of your partnership, your koinonia, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, you've invested yourself in the work of the gospel. And I'd like to suggest that as much as contributing to the needs of the saints refers to our relations in the church with one another, practicing hospitality suggests a strategy for evangelism or outreach. And I do know that we think of practicing hospitality as getting together with our family and our friends and people we've known for a long time. And that, that is a sense of hospitality, but not in a biblical uh, terminology, because here's what this word is. Greek students, it's a combination of two words. One is family love or family bonds. That same word, filial, family bonds, Philadelphia, family bonds. And the second word is stranger. Hospitality means expressing family bonds, family affections with people you don't know. People who may very well be outside of the body of Christ. A sharing of family atmosphere or setting with those you don't know. You know, we scratch our heads sometimes and we wonder, how can we reach those who are without Jesus? But perhaps it's been staring at us in the face all along, and it's hospitality. It's showing family bondedness, family affections to those who we don't know, who don't know Christ. That's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus says, no greater love is there than this, that one laid down his life for his friend. But you know, Jesus laid his life down for us long before you and I saw him as our friend. He looked at us and he died on the cross for us. Even though we were at enmity against God the Father, our sin had separated us from him. We were orphans in this world. But our God, through the mercy of of forgiveness that he offers on the cross, says, here is how I want to adopt you. I want to be your forever father. I want to be your forever family. And he sends his son who dies on the cross for us and he rises again. I believe that the single greatest act of hospitality, biblical hospitality, was Jesus' work on the cross. When Jesus died for us, he did something most of us would only do for family. I would lay my life down for my family, wouldn't you? You may not even have to think twice about it because you love your family. Jesus laid his life down for us. 
Romans 5 says that scarcely would one die for a righteous man, but Christ died for the ungodly. He loved you so much and identified so much with your sin that he that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Has there been a point in your life that you've placed your faith and trust in Christ Jesus as your Savior? Would you like to do that right now? Pray with me if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe my sin has separated me from you. I also believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again from the dead to give me eternal life. And right now, I put my trust in Jesus. I receive the free gift of grace. I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Father, I pray for that person that has just put their trust in Christ as their Savior. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in their heart and their life and help them to uh, grow in relationship with you and then help them to connect into a church family and bring us around them and help us to help them grow in Christ. And Father, I, I pray right now for our church body and I thank you for each and every one. I thank you, our Father, that there is no one that is forgotten by you. I thank you, our Father, that uh, you love us, you care so much for us, you go before us, and you prepare our way. I thank you for the opportunity to worship together in your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would raise up within us a love that is without hypocrisy. We look at this list and we see qualities that are like your son, the Lord Jesus. Help us to be like Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.